Okay, Sheila, take it away. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's my pleasure pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, Paul Jones, our speaker for this evening, showcasing his amazing photography and knowledge of the birds of our area tonight. Everyone who enjoyed his excellent presentation to the club on the birds and wildlife at, of the South County South Shore, particularly the shorebirds that visit Charwell Point, will know exactly what to expect tonight a really fascinating reflection on what and who we are soon to see in the county. Paul grew up in Ottawa and began birding at an early age. He recently retired from his job in Ottawa and lives in a home near Prince Edward Point and now devotes much of his time to bird watching and wildlife photography. He volunteers at the Prince Edward Point Bird Observatory Banding Station each spring and fall, and is an active member of the South Shore Joint Initiative. Paul participated as a leader in Peck Fen's BioBlitz at Macaulay Mountain in June. He also very generously provided photos for a 2023 calendar, and we've already heard of this from, from um, Amy, the sale of which is, is going to be used as a fundraiser to be shared by PEPBO, SJSJI, and PECFEN. So we really thank him. I think that by the end of Paul's presentation, most of us will actually be looking forward to, to winter. <laughs> Although perhaps maybe not to the snow, the storms and the cold, but definitely to seeing the, the avian guests who we soon expect. We are so fortunate that Paul has agreed to talk to us this evening. So with no further ado, I'd like to invite Paul to tell us about the winter birds of Prince Edward County. Paul. Thank you for that great introduction. I will now attempt the technical feat of sharing the screen. Okay, how does that look, everyone? Looks great, Paul. Looks good. Excellent. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, and uh, let's get going. It's been a really nice fall, at least the last week or so. But as we know, things are going to change and it's going to start getting a bit snowy. So what a great time to talk about the winter birds of Prince Edward County. This is a presentation for the Prince Edward County Field Naturalist Club by me, Paul Jones, with my photographs. In terms of an outline, very brief, um, who, as in uh, who are the winter birds of Prince Edward County and where, as where can they be seen? There's also a when question and that is when is winter? There's a couple definitions, meteorological winter, December, January, February, and also astronomical winter from the solstice to the equinox. Uh, we're gonna go for the purposes of this talk with meteorological winter, because I think it better suits kind of the, the cold months um, uh, that, that define who our winter birds are. So charging right ahead, who are the winter birds? Um, the Prince Edward County bird list has 350 species, and that's all four seasons. Uh, in the winter, however, there's about 125. So um, what happens? Why are there only 125? Well, as we know, it gets cold, and that makes it harder for a lot of species to find food. So birds leave. Here's a stilt sandpiper, and you can imagine if it was um, frozen, it wouldn't be doing so well. So birds like that skedaddle southwards. Um, interestingly, a lot of birds leave in August and September. So like this pine warbler, for example, that was out at Prince Edward Point. Uh, and this happens long before the freeze up. So what seems to trigger the departure is, is not the cold itself, but day length. 
So when the days start to get shorter, creates hormonal changes in the birds and, and gets that migration urge for them to head south. So um, they leave because it's gonna get cold, but not because it is cold, if that makes sense for the most part. Um, but fortunately, um, not everyone leaves. Some birds stay, um, like this American goldfinch. And some birds arrive from the north, like this Iceland gull, which is appropriately sitting on a pile of ice. Um, who are these stayers and arrivers? Uh, seven categories. There are permanent residents, winter residents, the semi-hardy, the lingerers, kind of a sad group, eruptors, pioneers, and rare birds. Uh, the source of this list, um, not really scientific. I invented it. Um, the idea was to impose some order on nature but as often with such projects, it doesn't really work. Uh, the categories kind of fall apart. I think it's still a useful framework, at least for making sort of broad generalizations about what birds are here and illustrates nature's complexity. So charging ahead, group one, the permanent residents. About 40 of them, uh, of which the black-capped chickadee, which I think is about my favorite bird, is a, is a good representative. These are birds that are here all year. They can find food in the, in the winter and they can survive the cold. I guess physiologically, they have certain elements of them that allow them to, to stay warm. Um, they're non-migratory, um, partly, and some of them are migratory. And this is where the, the category started to fall apart a bit. Um, and you'll, you'll see why. So here is um, the first sort of subgroup is true permanent residents, like the pileated woodpecker. These birds are non-migratory and it's the same ones all year. So if you see pileated in your backyard in August and it's there in September and October, November, good chance it's the same one. They're not really going anywhere. Stable, reliable, dependable. I think of them as kind of the old county birds. If you take a look at the range map from Cornell University, just a single color, uh, purple for a year round, not really moving at all anywhere. Now this contrasts with what I think of as um, deceptive permanent residents. Uh, for example, the blue jay. Now these are birds that are, are here all year, but they're also prone to wander. Almost a crypto migration happens. Here's a photo from uh, Point Peter a few falls back. And these are blue jays heading south in huge flocks. Sometimes you'll see two, 300, 400, even a thousand birds gathering at those headlands and heading out over the lake. Um, so as a species, blue jays are here all year, but as individuals, it's not necessarily the same ones. I hope this makes sense. Um, they come and go. And so <laughs> um, they're kind of like Torontonians. There's, there's always blue jays in the county. It's just not all the same ones. Same with folks from Toronto. They're always here, but they, uh, they're not always the same ones. Uh, you can take a look at the blue jay range map and you see that there is some kind of bleed over to the west and probably our birds head, head south into the lower states. Um, interestingly, black-capped chickadee uh, is also one of these deceptive permanent residents. This is a bird that I had always you know, considered fairly um, stable geographically, but if you're down in the county this time of year, the chickadees are really building up on the South shore. They wanna leave. I'm not sure where they're coming from or where they're going, but they're getting kind of frantic. This one was feeding on some goldenrod before getting ready to head across the lake. Another uh, permanent resident, American Robin. Is this the first sign of spring? Uh, maybe somewhere, but not really here because they are uh, here all year. We'll take a look at the map from Cornell University, um, the breeding range year round in winter, and we're solidly within that year round range in, uh, in Prince Edward County. So that's the first group, permanent residents. A um, little tricky with those true ones and, and uh, uh, quasi-permanent residents, but that's that. Uh, group two is the winter residents. About 25 of these birds, uh, of which the dark-eyed junco is a good representative and a great little bird. 
These are birds that arrive in October and leave in April. So they're here all winter. They come down from the north. Um, why? Well, presumably it's warmer here and they can find more food. But that begs the question, why not be like Cecile and head all the way to Florida? <laughs> and I guess the answer is, um, it's a shorter, safer migration. Migration is probably one of the biggest dangers that, that um, these small birds face. And if they don't have to go all the way, if they can survive in the weather here, then, then they'll hold up here. Another uh, great little winter resident, you see that red cap. It's got that seed crushing bill. Not a lot of streaks. And it's got that distinctive dot on the chest, making this an American tree sparrow. Really a wonderful little bird, um, kind of sings softly even on the coldest days in the winter. Uh, a real pick me up for uh, those doldrums in um, Sorry about that. Uh, in February, when things seem a bit bleak. Here we can take a look at the, um, the bar chart. There it is arriving in October, probably already a few in the county and really solidly here all through winter and then leaving towards the end of April. And then obviously as a winter resident, not here in the summer at all. Here's the range map showing the same thing, nesting up in the taiga near the tree line, the boreal forest, migrating to the central part and then wintering to the south, including Prince Edward County. Um, some other winter residents, familiar ones, a great bird, the snow bunting coming down from the Arctic. Again, they should be arriving shortly. I haven't heard any records yet. Uh, and this interesting bird, we know, we know it's a gull, but we look at the tail, there's no dark in the wings and it's got that strongly bicolored bill. So this is a glaucous gull, a, a, a young bird, and this was at Picton Harbor in last winter. Here's the range map. Again, you can see nesting up in the high Arctic and then it uh, heads south where to the, the balmy warmth of Prince Edward County in January. Um, an iconic winter bird, winter resident, the snowy owl. This one was out at Prince Edward Point. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about this bird and how maybe um, you could see one if that's something that you really want to do. Um, a special subset of winter residents are, are waterfowl, like this uh, great long-tailed duck. The uh, South Shore important bird in biodiversity area, the IVA in Prince Edward County, uh, super important. It holds a significant percentage of North America's wintering long-tailed ducks, uh, greater scop and white-winged scoter. So we're blessed to be able to see some amazing uh, natural spectacles in terms of these huge flocks of these birds and also to be aware of how important it is for their population and their population survival. Here's off Prince Edward Point, just the fragment of a big scop flock going by. They're already starting to gather. You can see them off um, Traverse Woods. Uh, another bird showing up in numbers now is uh, Redhead. These are in Prince Edward Bay. You can see the distinctive two towers there in the background. Um, back to this great bird, one of my favorites, long-tailed duck. Um, thousands and thousands of them off Prince Edward Point and off Point Peter and all along anywhere there's open water in the winter, there's likely to be a few long-tailed ducks. Um, not great at uh, landing in the water. They show more enthusiasm and finesse. They kind of just fly into it and bounce it along until they come to a stop. But a super great bird must have some kind of antifreeze because they can survive in the icy water. Okay, um, those are the winter residents. Group three, the semi-hardy. About 10 of these birds. Kind of a subset of category two, but I felt it deserved a sort of own discussion. These are birds that are migratory, um, but Prince Edward County is at the northern limit of their winter range. So most of them winter south of here and are, are a little more attuned to slightly warmer weather. And in the county, they're kind of hanging on by their toes um, through January and February. It's actually their toes that start to get damaged from the cold. So white-throated sparrow. Um, so here's the range map. You can see Prince Edward County just barely scrapes into the into the winter range of these birds. So 
This one is perhaps wondering, did I make a mistake? Why didn't I fly a bit farther south? Some other birds I've categorized as semi-hardy song sparrow. Um, often so, they are here. They are here in the winter. Um, not a lot of them, but around creeks and drains, they seem to um, like a little bit of water to survive. And you'll see them through December, January, February. Their numbers start to thin out, but they do. Some of them do make it all the way through. Uh, another one, a bit of a surprise to me, a great bird, the hermit thrush. Super uh, quiet and uh, not very conspicuous at all. But in some of the cedar swamps where there's little water seeps, they, they will overwinter successfully. Um, here's a bird at my feeder. It's got a brown head. So it's a brown headed cowbird. Um, I think a bunch of these birds are, are able to move this far north um, because of bird feeders. I think some cowbirds might survive, but um, birds like the cowbird and this one, super bird. It's rusty, so it's a rusty blackbird, species at risk. Um, can winter here. Uh, I think the feeder, bird feeders really help them survive. Um, here's a surprise, um, a yellow rumped warbler. Now, I would think of warblers as kind of the quintessential um, neotropical migrant going like clockwork back and forth from South America or, or Central America. Uh, in the spring and fall, completely gone in the winter, but yellow rump warblers are an exception. They can survive here. And the thing that helps them along is Eastern red cedar berries or cones. Probably Terry Sprague could explain this better than I could, but in some years there's very good crop of them. And when there is, they, the, um, the warblers can survive and, and, and feed on these as well as many other birds as well. It was these berries in fact, that gave cedar waxwing its name apparently, because they really love them as well. Okay, so that's the semi-hardy. Now group four, the lingerers, kind of a sad group. These are birds that should have left, but didn't for whatever reason. Their, their uh, software was had a glitch in it and they just didn't make the migration south. Uh, this is a brown thrasher I saw in February on Hilltop Road. And you can see the wings are starting to droop. That's often a sign that uh, the cold is starting to get to them. Take a look at the range map. You can see the wintering range down kind of um, far north is the Carolinas, maybe a little farther north, but really nowhere near the county. So this bird made a mistake. Um, something happened and didn't migrate. And as we can see from the bar chart from the eBird in Prince Edward County, a few smattering of winter records, but they don't make it all the way through. Here's another interesting record um, found by uh, or Amer an American bittern, which of course is a, is a wetland bird, found by Steve, reported to Terry, and then uh, passed on to Tom Wheatley, who uploaded it to eBird. Uh, quite remarkable that, that this bird that depends on kind of uh, wetland areas, marsh areas, made it all the way through Jan mid January. I took a look for it. Um, a couple of days after this, the whole area was frozen solid. So I'm sure this, this bird didn't make it. So again, it didn't have the, the, the clue to, to migrate and whatever genetic uh, problem, if that was what it was, um, is now eliminated from the, from the population. Um, some other of these lingerers, uh, Eastern Meadowlark, often see them in December into early January, and then they, they gradually disappear, quite often by roadsides. There's another bird, this is out on Big Island, um, a savanna sparrow, should be wintering south of here. But again, this one was, was sometime in January and then it disappeared when I was back to look for it in February. Again, by the roadsides, I think when the plow goes by and scrapes the, uh, the grass, they can find seeds and a bit of bare earth to feed. Here's another lingerer, swamp sparrow. I was thinking like, what's going on here? Are there any advantages or are these birds just um, going to all tragically um, pass away. I guess um, they'll be climate change ready. So if there's a population of birds that for whatever reason should migrate but doesn't, as the climate warms, um, they may be able to stay and sort of convert to a semi-hardy category where, where most of them do survive. 
as opposed to all dying. And then at some point, maybe 40 or 50 years from now, hopefully not sooner, they become a, uh, a full-time winter resident. A happier group, group five, the eruptors, of which the common red, well, there's about 10 of them, and the common red pole is a classic example. Um, super neat birds. They're obviously excited because they're moving around, and it's also neat for us as uh, naturalists and bird watchers to uh, wait to see who's going to show up. Um, what is an eruption? I could, I'm not sure how it's different from an eruption like a volcano, a breaking or bursting in, a violent incursion or invasion. And then for ecological purposes, it's a sudden increase in an animal population. And it typically is um, refers to birds, uh, finches that nest up north. And then when the food supply doesn't do so well, they come flooding south. If there's a good, for example, pine cone crop up north or a birch catkin, or alder catkin, then the birds will stay. When that crop is weak, they'll come flooding south. In fact, uh, the phenomena is closely tracked. There's a winter finch forecast. It used to be done by Ron Pinaway. Now it's done by a great friend of uh, county brooding, Tyler Hoare. Um, taking a look at the, the food crop, the cone crop, and other uh, mountain ash berries across uh, Canada and making a prediction on what's gonna happen. You can see, um, I talked about the red pole earlier as a, a classic example as, uh, of an eruptive species. If we look at the, go back to those trustworthy uh, eBird bar chart list for the county, take a look at the all-time bar chart for common red pole. And you can see that um, solidly, you know, arriving end of October, staying through the winter, it looks like it's in pretty good numbers. That's all time, however. If you look at 2022, just a single record. So last year was a non-eruptive year or a non-invasion year for common red pole. Uh, we'll see what happens this year. Maybe we'll get a lot of them. Maybe we'll get none at all. But we'll find out in the next uh, in the next several weeks. I think um, Tyler's forecast suggested it would be not a banner year, but there would be some red poles around this year. Uh, another one of these winter finches, pine siskin. They're already um, showing up uh, two, three, four a day in at Prince Edward Point at the Bird Observatory, coming overhead. A bird that nests all across um, the boreal forest from, I think, well, I guess probably from Newfoundland all the way to British Columbia up into Alaska. And we can see here a chart prepared by Project Feeder Watch, which uh, tracks uh, pine siskin banding records. These blue dots are birds that are, are banded and recovered in the north. So the triangle represents where it was banded. So here we have one that looks maybe a little north of Hamilton, uh, where it was banded and then it's recaptured all the way out near California. So there's an east-west movement of these birds looking for looking for uh, for pine cones to eat, I guess. Or they seem to like, actually, they like the little cedar cones. Um, birds that end up south, here this one's down in Texas, and then um, recaptured near Thunder Bay. So it shows you the interesting um, uh, and dynamic range of these birds as they traveled around North America looking for food to eat in the winter. Um, not just finches. Here's a nice red-breasted nuthatch. I was going to make a joke about holding my camera upside down, but I couldn't quite figure out what the punchline was. Anyway, a nice red-breasted nuthatch. They are moving through in pretty good numbers. They appeared actually in August at, at the at the Bird Observatory, and now they're still trickling through, heading south for some reason. Um, not a finch, obviously. A snowy owl, but it's an eruptive species as well. Um, as people know, they uh, rely on lemmings to a large degree in the north and when the lemming population crashes they'll come south. Uh, some years there's very few snowies, other years there's just uh, all sorts of them around all over the place. We'll see what happens this fall. So that's the eruptors group six, the pioneers, um, brave little birds like this Carolina wren. Um, these are non-migratory species. Um, and they're ones whose range is slowly expanding north. So they're not migrating, they're just settling sl slowly, kilometer by kilometer, year after year. Uh, how do we know this? Well, we have a time machine. And that time machine is the classic text, The Birds of Canada by Earl Godfrey. So this was first published in 1996, and it contains range maps. 
uh, from 1966. So let's take a look, hop into our time machine. We're going back to 1966. And as you can see, um, a tiny little range down in Southern, the, sorry, the screen's being blocked here, but um, down in Southern Ontario in the Leamington, uh, Windsor area, and then nothing around our part. Um, fast forward to 2022, and uh, you can see how they are now. Um, have, have moved north and east and are in the county. Uh, there are quite a few around this spring. It's a great new addition to our uh, local Ivafana, a really wonderful song. So hopefully they'll continue their trek north. Um, another pioneer, maybe we don't think of it as so much uh, because there's such a, a settled uh, feature of our, our local bird population. But again, we go back to 1966 and they, uh, are not in the county. I mean, there may have been occasional strays, but they were, were not a solidly established nester. Now we bump ahead to 2022 and they're here doing well. And they've in fact, even gone into the Maritimes. Here's another one. It's got that uh, checkerboard back pattern, red on the back of the head, wood chips are flying. And it's got a uh, no sign of any red on the belly. So that makes it a red-bellied woodpecker. We bump in our time machine, go back to 1966. Uh, Earl Godfrey didn't even provide a range map. It was such a rare bird in Canada then, just reference to them being seen in extreme southern Ontario. And now we bump forward to 2022 and we can see that uh, again, they've crept north and they're in the county. Now these are all um, pioneers from the south. There are or there is a pioneer from the north. If we look at this bird, we can see there's some uh, white in the secondaries, strongly uh, banded tail, very sharp demarcation between that black tip and the white base. Small head, no speckles on the belly, so we know this is a golden eagle, great bird. But it's not the one we're interested in. We're looking at this one here, the common raven. Nineteen sixty-six, and you can see the range of common raven was well north of, of the county. Then, I think what happened was there were huge um, predator control programs. They would poison carcasses, leave them out to kill wolves, and that bumped off a lot of the ravens as well. So they were not around back then. Fast forward to twenty twenty-two. We look at the Cornell University map, and we discover that they got it wrong error. So we fix it. Um, and we can see that now that uh, common ravens are breeding in the county. They've moved south. There's actually a nest you can see from the road down at the DND um, radio, radio array at uh, Point Peter. Some future pioneers. Um, possibility is Carolina chickadee, a bird that's just making its way up towards the southern side of Lake Erie, but in another 20, 30, 40 years may may move north as well as the climate warms. Uh, something fun to look for, they're basically identical to black cap chickadees, so it'll be a fun challenge. I know they've had some at Point Pelee down on Lake Erie. Uh, fish crow, another bird that's, that's moving north uh, up the Mississippi and Ohio rivers and along the Eastern seaboard. Might be a while before it's, it's wintering here, but it is a bird that is showing up. There are a lot, um, quite a few records this spring. Again, pretty much identical in appearance to, uh, to our American crow, but a very different um, sound, really a nasal eh, eh, as opposed to that hoarser caw from the, the regular American crow. Um, so those are the pioneers. Um, next, what do we have? Our last category seven, the rare birds. Uh, we have this one here. It's kind of brown and streaky. It's got that seed crushing bill. Interesting black pattern on the face. So we know that this is a Harris's sparrow. As you can see from the eBird uh, bar chart, hardly any records at all. 
as uh, also demonstrated by the range map from Cornell University, nesting up in the uh, right near the tree line in Canada. I think this is actually the only bird that nests only in Canada, or Canada's only uniquely nesting bird. It does, it's not an endemic as it goes down to the States, but it's the only bird that nests only in our wonderful country. So it migrates down to the center part there and then ends up down on the Southern Plains to winter. So you can see it had to wander quite a way to get over to Dale Smith's house. So um, this came to his feeder in his, his yard in Wellington and he got the word out and a lot of people were able to enjoy and see that bird. So thank you, Dale. Here's a bird that was at my feeder. It's kind of rare. Um, brown and streaky a bit, seed crushing bill, no stripes on the front, little red cap, making it a white crown sparrow. Now, I took some other pictures of it and John Ruddy, who's a bird guide up in Ottawa, took a look at them and he said, Paul, I think what you have there is, if you look at the bill, it's orange, not pink. And the lores, that space between the eyes and the bill is pale. So what you have there is a Gamble's white crown sparrow. It's not a full species. It's the Western subspecies of, um, of white crown sparrow. So kind of a neat record. Other rare birds. This is one that everyone can look for at their feeders, um, especially if it's a good red pole year, those eruptive species. Notice it's got that little red hat. Um, pretty pale overall. The bill is kind of pushed in, buried in feathers. And then under the tail, it's, it's pretty white. So that makes it a hoary red pole, which is a neat little bird. Probably maybe one out of 100, one out of 200 red poles is a hoary. You can compare it with the common red pole. It's got that little red hat, but much dingier bird. The bill sticks out more and the undertail coverts have that streaking. Um, what else? Here is an interesting bird out at the Prince Edward Point. It's a towhee, but what kind? I submitted a photo to eBird. It said wanted more information. So I went out and took another picture, looked at it, was covered with spots and it's a towhee. So what does that make it? A spotted towhee, um, which as we look at the range map, you can see is a super Western bird. They didn't even um, bother to put in Prince Edward County on the map, it's so out, out of range. Um, made the front page of our, our gazette. A little congratulations to the mayor. Um, I kept this thing alive all winter. I shoveled the snow and put down bird seed and it survived and lots of folks came out to see it. Probably two or 300 people from all across Ontario came out to look at it. It's not a bird that occurs in the province every year. So a super nice rarity treat for the county. Uh, what else? Uh, ducks are always a good thing to look for for rare birds. You can see that the white space there between the eye and the bill is fairly round, whereas on this one it's more crescent shaped. No black spur there. We've got a black spur there. Back is pretty white on that common golden eye. Here it's pretty black, so that one is a barrel's golden eye that we uh, discovered out on Cressy Lake sign. Again, maybe one or two records a year if that. So it was a good, a good, a fun winter find. Harlequin duck, a bird of special concern. This one was out at Prince Edward Point a couple falls ago and then into the early winter. Other rare birds of the list is, is, is very, very long. I'll just flip through a couple, a few of them. A deer falcon, super neat Arctic um, falcon. Mountain bluebird, another bird from the West that likes the, uh, the red cedar berries. Uh, same with towns and solitaries. You can actually see it there. Nice photo of it on the red cedar. Buried thrush, another Western bird. Uh, great gray owl. So great gray owl, hawk owl, boreal owl, all possibilities to show up. Things to look for. So that's part one, a quick recap. We have permanent residents, winter residents, the semi-hardy, lingerers, eruptors, pioneers, and rare birds. Part two, uh, where can we see them? Well, let's um, start by looking at Prince Edward County, zooming in a bit to the more Southern part starting in the center of the world, Picton. And the Picton Harbor is a great place in the winter to drop in. Easy to find. Start at what I call the Hill of Death, head east down Bridge Street. And right in that inner 
portion. Oftentimes there's some open water holding uh, ducks. Mallard is the most common, some black ducks as well. And see, this one is interestingly infringing on the bargaining unit work of the merganser group by eating fish. I didn't realize that mallards ate fish, but here it's got a nice gizzard shad. There's some kind of a run of these little fish up the, up the creek. Um, what else? When there's th those kind of overwintering ducks, often there'll be um, some rare ones uh, interspersed. This was a wood duck that uh, a female wood duck that spent a couple winters on the ice there. Um, people do feed the ducks and that helped it to survive. Again, um, made the Gazette and a really neat sighting and uh, congrats again to our mayor. Other birds, uh, there is that little bit of open water. This isn't a duck, it's a pied billed grebe, but it has survived there at least two winters. Maybe it'll come back again this year. And another gull, no black in the wingtips. It's got that uh, bicolor bill, so we know it's a glaucous gull. A really neat sighting right in the inner harbor. harbor. You can see those new condos in the background. So we've gone from Picton heading over towards the Bloomfield area. There's a, a rather obscure road, Wesley Acres Road. It's, it's, it's pretty much like a lot of other roads, but for some reason it often holds birds in the winter, so it's a nice place to stop in on so pro proceeding west from Bloomfield and then heading down the road. Um, good place to see some winter birds often it's it's very reliable for a horned lark. It's super great uh, little winter open country winter bird. So we continue our westward trek to Wellington, land of Dale Smith and his Harrison Sparrow and we visit the Wellington Harbor. Um, easy to find we all know where that is. Uh, again, some open water, holding waterfowl. You can see this one has some green in the wings, which makes it a green wing teal. Um, a little farther north, and it usually um, winters. You can see it's literally freezing its butt off. Uh, not quite suited to the, to the cold here, but I think this bird made it through, thanks to the generous handouts from folks. Some scop as well. You can see the, the blue bill, as the hunters uh, call them. That black and white body. There's greater scop and lesser scop. This one has kind of a peaked rear head, so we know that that's a lesser scop. Now, where there's a lot of waterfowl around, um, there will be predators like this peregrine falcon. So they're hunting the ducks there. This one right out on the ice had caught a golden eye. So there we have nature red in tooth and claw. We won't look at that for too long. Um, once you've checked out the Wellington Harbor, Good idea to check out Wellington Beach as well, kind of windswept, but can hold some interesting birds. There's oftentimes um, long-tailed duck off there, as well as some gulls. Here was an Iceland gull that was there one December. Similar to the Glaucus gull, but it's got that all dark bill in the uh, juvenile plumage. So we head out from Wellington down south eastwards towards Sandbanks Provincial Park, really an another fantastic gem in the county. Zoom in a bit. The outlet beach area and the, the, the wood lots behind there are really get great place to check for both water birds and land birds. And an area I like is the Lakeview Trail area, which seems to be particularly good for barred owl in the winter. Think of owls as nocturnal birds, maybe other than snowy owls, but barred owls in the county are often out hunting during the day, particularly if it's a dark day. And uh, I wouldn't say they're friendly, but they're, they're rather unwary and you can oftentimes get quite a good look at them. From uh, Sandbanks, we head down to Point Peter. I was going to call it Point Petra just to torment people. I was, it was clarified very early on to me that it's Point Peter, not uh, Point Petra. Location right in the southeast. Think of winter as kind of an idyllic time in our memories, but some days it's bitterly cold. You can see here the, a lot of atmospheric dis distortion over the lake on a, on a freezing day. But a big bunch of redheads over the, um, off the point. Here's the glaucous gull eating a, a long-tailed duck that had washed up. A warning to be careful on those shorelines. I've fallen a couple times pretty badly. So if you are gonna bird along the shore, get those ice cleats on your feet. From Point Peter, we head east down Army Reserve Road if we're brave or on Royal Road. 
to County Road 13 to Long Point Road and head out to the Prince Edward Point, Prince Edward Point National Wildlife Area. Again, just a fabulous place. Here we are at sunrise in winter, uh, the sun coming up south over the lake and the uh, Point Traverse Lighthouse illuminated by the glow. Um, interesting place for a variety of reasons. One is that it's kind of a sentinel location and that we have those prevailing winds from the west blowing down the county, pushing birds out onto the, uh, to the edge of the point where they can be, uh, they kind of bunch up and can be observed. So right now, in fact, uh, evening grosbeaks are moving through. I had six of them this morning, which is the most I've had so far this fall. Um, mostly it's been ones and twos. But the sign this isn't one of those eruptive species and maybe a good sign that we're gonna have some around this winter. Uh, other birds, there were, I don't know why, it's hard to count birds out there because they swirl around, but there were two, three, 400 waxwings, cedar waxwings this morning quite a, a, a spectacle. Here's a, um, a flock of waxwings that I had out there later uh, last year. I think this was early January even. And if you zoom in, sorry for the quality, you can see that yellow belly and white undertail coverts is cedar waxwing. But these other ones have that distinctive orange undertail coverts, so we know that they are bohemian waxwings. So keep an eye on those uh, waxwing flocks um, and the bohemians might start showing up. Of course, uh, the classic Prince Edward County winter bird, long-tailed duck, great place to see them out there. Um, so with that nice photo, we'll leave the Prince Edward point and conclude with a brief discussion about seeing a snowy owl. This is something that People have asked me about how to see one. Uh, truly a fantastic bird, a, a Canadian icon. Best place to see them in the county is unfortunately Amherst Island, which <laughs> as we know is not in the county, but it's really an extraordinary place for owls and, and probably the most reliable place locally to see snowies. Um, doesn't mean there, are, there aren't snowies in the county. They are here, they'll be here soon. Um, just not quite as reliable as Amherst. So if you really, 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 really want to see a snowy, that's the place to head. Um, otherwise, um, they are here and a good place to look for them is hydro poles. So this can be in rural areas. They like open fields, um, places where there's uh, meadow voles, I think Microtus pennsylvanicus is its scientific name. Um, they like to feed on those. But they're also, you know, you'll see them in maybe downtown Wellington or even on a building in, in uh, Prince Edward County in uh, Picton. So keep your eyes to the extent it's safe up on the top of hydro poles and you may see them. Um, if you don't come across one by chance, then you can do specific search for them late November, uh, mid December. I mean, they'll, they'll start showing up, you know, soon, ones or twos, but it's really sort of late November, mid December. They start to um, uh, gather is a bit strong word, but you can see them at Point Peter, right underneath the the uh, DND radio array. There's a big field there. That's a good place to see them. The other place is a Prince Edward Point, right around the lighthouse. I've often seen them there, even sitting on top of the lighthouse. So that's super cool. Then I don't know by by the end of December, early January, they they leave, and I think they head over to Amherst Island, I guess. So that's the presentation, Winter Birds of Prince Edward County. Back to the, uh, the beautiful dawn scene at Prince Edward Point. And if there's some questions, I will try to answer them. Okay, um, Paul, that was terrific. We're gonna ask Helen to run the question period. Helen, are you up for that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so far, I don't see any. <laughs> so I guess people can think about their questions. Uh, well, I actually have a question, um, not a real birder, so I probably should know the answer to this. But, well, first of all, I just would like to say that I really liked all the categories. I thought it was really neat to classify the birds into these categories that you did. 
But my question is about the lingers, the lingers. So these are, I think you said, so these are individual birds that <clears throat> somehow missed, they were supposed to go south and they, they didn't for some, some reason, some error. So what I was wondering was why only specific species are lingers? Like can't any species become a linger? Like any normally migrating species? Yes, any species can become a lingerer. Um, it's just a lot of them are, are so attuned to living in warmer climes that they won't even make it through the end of October. Um, oh, okay. So they'll die. They'll mm -hmm. die early and they don't, <laughs> they don't graduate to the lingerer class. But I mean, oh. I, could, I could go through the, the Prince Edward County list and, 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 and look at all the things um, that have stayed around. I don't know that it's happened in Prince Edward County, but there have been hummingbirds in Ontario until December, people keeping them alive at their feeders. <laughs> Um, and these are birds just, uh, I mean, sometimes they're, they may be injured birds, so they can't, they can't fly south. There's a poor rehab Canada goose at, uh, at the harbor at Prince Edward Point right now. They can't fly. I don't, I don't know how well it's going to do as, the, as the, the water freezes up. Um, but there are other birds where it's not an injury. It's just, it's just they didn't have the right code uh, to send them south. And so they don't make it. It's like some of those rare birds as well, like the, that spotted towhee or the Harris's Sparrow, instead of doing a north-south migration, um, they went west or they went east instead. Um, and so they ended, up, they ended up with us instead of with the Texans. So just the, these, these error codes happen and um, the results are usually unfortunate uh, for the ones that mm -hmm. I put in the, in the lingerer category. Okay. Okay, there's, th thank you for that answer. So there is a question from Bert. He says, Paul, what gear are you using? Um, for the for the camera? I would think so. Yes. He says yes. <sighs> there. <laughs> Just happened to have it lying around. Um, nothing particular. I mean, the, the lens is very nice. It's a 600 millimeter prime lens prime lens so it's not a zoom it's 600 millimeters all the time and it's f4 so it lets in a lot of light um i think that's the key piece the the camera body itself is a canon we're really blessed now with canon nikon and sony are all making extraordinary cameras uh extraordinary equipment i use the canon 90d which is quite an old model now but it's one that i like and i'm happy with um and uh i don't know if people are are, are interested in wildlife photography I think you need a, a lens that goes up to 500 millimeters and then pretty much any one of the modern bodies uh, will, will get you really excellent results. And then it's just patience uh, is one approach, uh, carefully stalking and figuring out what your shots are. Or you can do what I do if you have no attention span at all, it's just luck. Like I'll just, I carry the camera all the time and if birds fly away, I don't bother. But if there's that one out of a hundred that just decides to sit there and stay, then I'll, I'll photograph it. Okay, thank you. So uh, a question from Lise Gua, she asks, is it a good idea to try and keep some bare grassy areas to help some of the birds? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think because, uh, you know, if you, if you spread a bit of, of seed on the lawn, uh, in particular, that will help. I think one thing that I that people have thought about is whether feeding birds encourages them to stay when they otherwise might not stay. And my sense is it doesn't. So if you have a bit of a, a grassy area or um, so that they can, can dig around for seeds, I think it will help birds that were otherwise gonna stay anyway. Um, it, it may bring you know, birds from several kilometers away to your specific location, but it's not gonna convince anything not to migrate. I think these are birds that just are not going to move, and if they if they find some feet, some food, some feeders, some some grass areas, then they'll then they'll survive longer than they would have otherwise. I guess this is just a follow up question from me. I guess it's also a good idea to leave all your flowers, all your dead flowers, um, 
around and not cut them down because I guess the seeds could be edible by the birds. Is that true? Yeah, you know, um, Terry Sprague would be the one who, who's the, the, the bird feeding expert extraordinaire. Um, I'll just say generally that, that any, any kind of uh, brush provides shelter protection from the wind and, uh, and freezing rain and snow. And often there will be um, seeds that they can pick out of these flowers. And also the, the, the stalks and the flower, flower, dried flowers will hold bugs as well that they can eat. Oh, so right, a right. carefully manicured lawn looks nice, but it isn't always the, uh, the best for birds. Right. Okay, so there's a question from John Foster. Are you using mirrorless or DSLR? I'm using DSLR, the old technology. Um, I know Dale Smith is using uh, the, the new mirrorless stuff. I guess I'll switch at some point. I'm happy with the, this is a bit technical for folks who aren't maybe totally into to wildlife photography. Um, I like looking through the optical viewfinder, sort of a direct route to the bird. Um, but the new mirrorless technology, I think is, you know, superior focus, better image quality. It's the way of the future, but I'm just not there yet and may never be. Mm -hmm. How much are you cropping? Questions from Bert. Um, that's a lot. And I'm using a 600 millimeter lens and it's on a, what's called a crop sensor. So it, it has, it's a smaller sensor than a full frame sensor. Sorry for the technical stuff for people who aren't totally enthralled by this. Um, so it really has a lot of reach. Um, so it's really bringing the birds in by still almost probably 95% of the pictures I take, I, I'm cropping in. And as you crop in and remove areas around the edge, the subject obviously becomes bigger, but the image quality starts to fall apart. And that's one reason I like the 90D. It gets more pixels on the bird, as they say. Um, but yeah, the, the perpetual, <laughs> there's two problems. One is the bird is too far away. And then if it's close, there's a branch in front of it. So mm -hmm. those are the challenges of bird photography. Okay, here's an interesting question by, from Paula. She says, I'd like to put out winter bird feeders, but we live in a rural area with many hawks and crows and even ravens that will prey on the smaller birds that come to the feeder. Is it still worthwhile to put out bird feeders when some of the birds that use these feeders will be preyed upon? That's a really complex question. Um, and it rings particularly loudly because I have feeders up now and out on Long Point there's a huge hawk migration and basically it's a competition now between the blue jays and the sharp shinned hawks and the blue jays just eat at the feeder and the sharp shinned hawks come racing in and trying to attack them the blue jays squawk at them and then just go back to eating so it's an interesting <laughs> battle going on um, the blue jays are able to defend themselves quite well against the sharp shins but um you know, once every couple of weeks, there's a, a feather pile below the feeders of a morning dove that got bumped off. And I mean, I, I, these are all individual choices. I, perhaps the most ethical one would be not to feed birds at all. Um, I like to have the birds around. I think it does help them survive, but it also brings in hawks. The other thing I've thought about with hawks is hawks are gonna eat a certain number of birds a day. And mm -hmm. Um, they may grab them from a bird feeder or they may grab them from somewhere where there's no bird feeder, but they're going to be, they're going to be eating birds. Mm. I would, um, and again, I would de defer to, to Terry Sprague's knowledge on this, but um, if you keep the feeders close to your house and close to, to sheltered area, close to brush, if they're not totally out in the open and exposed, I think that helps. Um, there's both merlins and sharpshins around my feeder now, and they're not having an awful lot of luck. Um, so I guess, I'll, you know, it's, it's, it's trust your judgment. If you, if you want to, um, put up the feeders, I think it's not going to have any huge impact on overall bird population, but you know, there, there will be hawks visiting occasionally. Okay. Okay. So a question from John Foster, I guess another photography question. Are you shooting raw photos? and then processing them? I don't know if that's an acronym, R-A-W. Yeah. Um, 
the uh, so you take the picture and it, it transfers the lights into zeros and ones and stores it on your memory card and your camera, and it can store it either as JPEGs um, or as uh, as raw files. And I think of of JPEGs as kind of um, watery wine, and um, raw as a really uh, thick port. There's just so much more data, flavor, taste in the raw files than there are in the JPEGs. So when it comes to processing them, there's just way more information to work with. So you can, um, they call it, you can pull color out of shadows. You can diminish um, areas that are blown out if you shoot raw. So that was sort of my first big step to being a little more serious about bird photography was when I switched from shooting JPEGs, which are fine, uh, to, to raw files, which um, require uh, more processing, but allow you to achieve uh, much more interesting images, I think. So yeah, I, sh I shoot raw. Oh, that's interesting. So most, I guess most even ordinary cameras would allow you to shoot raw, right? Um, yeah, it depends. The, the, the typical default is, is JPEG. And then I think the, the various um, cell phones, hand phones have some pri proprietary uh, file format. I think when I try to process things off my iPhone, it's a HEC file or something, H-E-I-C. Oh, okay. Um, but any, any more than a, any, anything more than a, than a total beginner camera will allow you to, to switch to RAW. Now, the thing with the RAW files is you can't really see them until you process them if that makes sense. The JPEGs, you can just start firing around to your buddies. The raw files, you have to run through a program. Uh, Photoshop is obviously one of the most well-known. You can do all sorts of things. I use um, a, a, another Adobe product called Lightroom, which again, not quite as sophisticated as Photoshop, but allows me to do an awful lot. It's really come a long way. So what I'll do is I'll select the bird. It's isolated from the background, sharpen the bird up, um, remove some shadows, and then I'll switch to the background and I'll make the background nicer. So basic processing. And if you're shooting raw, it helps a lot. Okay. Okay, well, thanks, Paul. I don't see any other questions. So I guess, oh, well, Lise has a message. She says, um, wonderful presentation. Thank you for the great information. And I'm Thank sure that's so echoed by everyone here. Thank you so much. Oh, I have well, one more question from Bert. Hold on, sorry. Do you ever replace the background? No. Okay. Um, Good. But I will manipulate backgrounds quite a bit. Um, one thing I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll vignette. So um, dark in the corners, sort of pull in the corners a bit, not overly much because it gets a bit crazy, but just dark in the corners so the, the bird is a bit more focused. Um, I'll often um, change the color saturation in the background, um, bring out some colors or, or take them away depending on what looks good. But in terms of, you know, putting a bird against a full moon or something like that, no. I, I think it's fine if people want to do that. I just don't have the technical skill or the patience to, 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 to do that kind of manipulation. Okay, thank you again. People are saying great presentation, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for listening. So I guess, Amy, it's, it's yep. over to you. We're going to get Sheila to do the thank you. Um, I also told people before the thing started, before the meeting started, that people should read your Neotropic Cormorant article in the South Shore Liner. So I just want you to know that, John Foster. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> Sheila, will you do the thank you, please? Yes. Um, this was such an interesting presentation, Paul just packed with so much information. I can't believe it. It was great to have those distinctive characteristics to look for in, in identification. Um, the eBird charts were excellent and maps of distribution for um, breeding and wintering. 
Um, but probably most of all, I loved your categories. <laughs> it's great. They might not be perfect, but it's a, it's a good way of, of getting a handle on everything. And I especially liked your <laughs> deceptive permanent <laughs> residents, <laughs> equating those to the Torontonians. <laughs> so in all, it was just um, really, really excellent. And can't thank you enough for going to, to the trouble of putting it all together for us. Well, thank you so much. You're so welcome and thank you for the kind words. <laughs> Great. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. Stop cloud.